Matthew 28, please, this morning. Matthew 28. We'll talk about the resurrection today. Matthew 28. And a message entitled, He is Risen as He Said. And I realize maybe, you know, people say, well, Paul didn't title his messages. Well, it helps the sound booth. Amen. Praise God. He is risen as He said, Matthew 28. And uh, we'll begin reading here in verse 1. Matthew 28 and 1. The Bible says, In the end of the Sabbath, as it began to dawn toward the first day of the week, came Mary Magdalene and the other Mary to see the sepulcher. And behold, there was a great earthquake, for the angel of the Lord descended from heaven and came and rolled back the stone from the door and sat upon it. His countenance was like lightning and his raiment white as snow. And for fear of him, the keepers did shake and became as dead men. And the angel answered and said unto the women, Fear not ye, for I know that ye seek Jesus, which was crucified. He is not here, for he is risen, as he said. Come see the place where the Lord lay. And go quickly and tell his disciples that he is risen from the dead. And behold, he goeth before you into Galilee. There shall ye see him, who I have told you. And they departed quickly from the sepulcher with fear and great joy, and did run to bring his disciples' word. And as they went to tell his disciples, behold, Jesus met them, saying, All hail. And they came and held him by the feet and worshipped him. Then said Jesus unto them, Be not afraid. Go tell my brethren that they go into Galilee, and there shall they see me. Lord, we are thankful now for the scriptures. We're thankful for the record of the event of the resurrection of Christ. And I pray that you'll help me, Lord, to be able to share from the from the Bible the truths. Uh, that surround the resurrection. And then, Father, that your Holy Spirit might do that work that we cannot do and touch hearts and minds today with the thought of a resurrected Christ, one uh, that is coming in judgment, but one, Lord, also that is full of compassion. And I pray that you'll help now God, give us the strength to do that we need to do. In Jesus' name I pray, amen. The resurrection of Jesus Christ is maybe one of the most argued truths of the Bible. Argued, I say, not by Christians. We believe that Jesus rose from the grave. But argued by skeptics. Uh, You and I that know the Lord, we have... Uh, an evidence of his resurrection because we have this living Savior dwelling within us by faith in the person of, of course, the Holy Spirit of God. One thing is sure, the resurrection of Christ is funda- fundamental to the Scriptures uh, and, uh, the, the, uh, and the Christian faith as a whole. And we'll see that in just a little bit. Uh, we know that... <clears throat> For God to resurrect someone is no small thing. We see it as huge. And we ought to. You and I can't do it. We couldn't even pretend to do it. But God that gave life can give it again when he's ready. Amen. If that's what he desires. And so the Bible says in Psalm chapter number 6 and verse 10. uh, For thou wilt not leave my soul in hell. Again a prophetic Uh, utterance there with regard to the promised resurrection of our Savior. Neither wilt thou suffer thine holy one to see corruption. Paul quoted that in the book of Acts when he was referring to the resurrected Christ. And then in Isaiah 26 and verse 19, the Bible says, Thy dead men shall live, together with my dead body shall they rise. Awake and sing, ye that dwell in dust, for thy dew is as the dew of herbs, and the earth shall cast out the dead. Of course, the Lord Jesus Christ himself spoke of his resurrection in Matthew 20 and verse 18. He said, Behold, we go up to Jerusalem, and the Son of Man shall be betrayed 
uh, into, unto the chief priests and the scribes, and they shall condemn him to death, and shall deliver him to the Gentiles to mock and to scourge and to crucify him, and the third day he shall rise again. Now, certainly we can't expect everyone would believe in the promise of the resurrection for several reasons. One, because Jesus said not everybody would believe. Wouldn't it be good if everybody just believed the Bible? Wouldn't it be good if everybody that needed Christ would just come to Christ and be saved? But they don't. And Jesus said, uh, you will not come to me that you might have life. And it wasn't, you cannot. He said, you will not. And so unfortunately, there are a lot of people like that in our day. And so we can't expect that everyone would believe the resurrection. Certainly even the disciples didn't believe right after the fact when it was reported to them. And they struggled, uh, I believe, because of the greatness of the event and the power of God that was revealed in that happening. Sometimes when God moves in our life, it's something so wonderful, we, <laughs> we just can't believe it. And so they didn't believe initially when, uh, when they heard about it. Uh, and uh, certainly the skeptics don't believe. But the disbelief of skeptics today doesn't change the fact of, of Matthew 28 and 6. He is risen, as he said. Amen. And so some thoughts this morning about the resurrection. He, uh, we're told in the Bible that the Lord rose from the grave <clears throat> three, three days after his death and burial. You find that in Luke 24 and 46. Thus it is written, and thus it behooved Christ to suffer and to rise from the dead the third day. And in Acts chapter number 2 and verse 40, the Bible says, Him God raised up the third day and showed him openly. God did not try to hide the resurrection. Uh, and uh, God, matter of fact, when God uh, um, brought the Lord Jesus Christ out of the grave, as far as God was concerned, it was just a fulfillment of his promise. That's the way God does. And so uh, uh, he raised him up the third day. Uh, we know that uh, had we been in that time, the week prior to this resurrection event that we just read, uh, the Lord would have come into Jerusalem. He purged the, simp uh, the temple for the second time. Uh, you know, when he saw the money changers there, he said, Look here, uh, my house is to be a house of prayer, and ye have made it a den of thieves. And you know, he turned the tables over and ran the scribes and the Pharisees and that whole bunch out of there, cleansed the temple. Uh, he taught uh, and debated in the temple prior, the week prior to his resurrection. He was there teaching the word of God, uh, talking about the greatness of God and the forgiveness of God and salvation in God uh, and helping to explain the scriptures to the people. Uh, he sent, as we read the Bible, we know that he sent two disciples ahead of him to prepare the way for Passover. Lord willing, we'll talk about that tonight in connection with the Lord's table. But he sent those, uh, uh, those disciples ahead of him uh, and uh, it, all in that week, and then, of course, uh, was condemned, crucified, and buried. And the Bible's clear that his burial, was, I mean, his crucifixion was brutal. Uh, he was rejected of his own people in favor of a murderer. Now, uh, there may have been a time when that would be hard to believe, but when you look at our society today, maybe not so much. Rejected of his own people in favor of a murder. He had been brutally beaten with a scourge. He was mocked, you know, with a crown of thorns and a robe um, uh, and uh, beaten again. He was nailed to the cross and crucified. That's Bible truth. I've told you before, when you read about the crucifixion, uh, God's not very detailed. You can read some books and articles and stuff that will go into all the detail of what happened on the cross of Calvary, but God doesn't do that because God never wanted us to feel sorry for Jesus. Jesus was on victor's row, <laughs> and he was gaining the victory for you and for, and for me. And so when the Bible talks about him being crucified, it simply says this, and they crucified him. That's it. Again, God fulfilling his promise. Now, some people believe that Jesus didn't really die on the cross. You, maybe you've heard that. But the Bible says in John 19 and 24, and of course the whole idea of denying the fact that he died is an attempt to deny the resurrection. But John 19, 24 says, But one of the soldiers with a spear pierced his side, and forthwith came there out blood and water. Now look, a man doesn't get beaten beyond recognition, nailed to a cross, pierced through the heart with a spear, and just pass out. 
No, he died. He died for you and me, shed his blood for you and me. And the Bible says that once he died, uh, they made his burial sure. If you look in Matthew 17 here and back to uh, verse number 62. The Bible says, now the next day that followed, Matthew 27, 62. Now the next day that followed, the day of the preparation, the chief priests and scribes uh, came together unto Pilate saying, sir, we remember that that deceiver said. Now, when you precede statements with, a, with, a, with an accusation like that, you know where the heart is. We remember that that deceiver said while he was yet alive that after three days I'll rise again. Command, therefore, that the sepulcher be made sure unto the third day, lest his disciples come by night and steal him away and say unto the people, He is risen from the dead. So the last error shall be worse than the first. Pilate said unto them, you have a watch, go your way, make it. <laughs> I love the way this is put in there, as sure as you can. Now, he didn't have any idea what he was talking about, but you and I do. He could do everything he could, humanly possible, to seal that tomb. Make it as sure, but there was nothing in the world he could do against the power of God. And so it's kind of funny how that's in there. Make it as sure as you can. So they went and made the sepulchre sure, sure, sealing the stone and setting a watch. And so they, they put it up there, they sealed it up, they put a watch on it, doing everything they could to prevent any kind of inclination that maybe Jesus had risen from the grave. <clears throat> and uh, he said the last error, he said, look here, if this ever gets out of a resurrection, we're finished for sure. If pe That's still true. If people start believing the resurrection, man, the devil's in trouble, Amen. <laughs> Amen. And so uh, his, his crucifixion was brutal. Uh, his burial was made sure. Uh, they did it the best they could, but they wasn't going to keep him in the grave. And so we read about in Matthew 28 his resurrection. Again, taking place those three days after. Jesus said, for as Jonas was three days and three nights in the whale's belly, so shall the Son of Man be three days and, and three nights in the heart of the earth. And there he was. But as we read verse 1 of chapter 28, in the end of the Sabbath, as it began to dawn toward the first day of the week, came Mary Magdalene and the other Mary to see the sepulcher. And so we find here that Jesus rose apparently sometime prior to dawn on Sunday. The first day of the week in your Bible is Sunday. The last day was the Sabbath, the seventh day. The first day is Sunday. And so sometime prior to their getting there, around dawn, uh, Jesus had risen from the grave. They had come to anoint the body, uh, and uh, because they weren't able to do that because uh, of the Sabbath, they weren't allowed to work on the Sabbath, so when Jesus died, they weren't able to get the body anointed and prepared and all of that. So they had come back to do that. Uh, and uh, matter of fact, the Bible's interesting that as they came that day to do that, they were wondering who was going to roll the stone back. Mark, uh, Mark tells us in chapter 16 and verse 3 that they were wondering who's going to roll that big stone back from uh, the tomb so we can get in there and do this necessary work we've got to do with the body. The Bible tells us here that uh, as they were coming along the way, of course, the Lord's resurrection was announced, first of all, by an angel in verse 2. And behold, there was a great earthquake, for the angel of the Lord descended from heaven and came and rolled back the stone from the door and sat upon it. And so as they approached the tomb, they began to realize we're not going to need him by roll that stone back. Because the angel rolled it back. And as the old preachers used to say, they did so not to let him out, but to let them in. He was already gone long before they got there. And so he announced the resurrection of the Lord to them. His countenance, verse 3, was like lightning, his raiment white as snow. And for fear of him, the keepers did shake and became his dead men. The guards passed out. And... <laughs> I would have too. Amen. And the angel answered and said unto the women, Fear ye not, for I know that ye seek Jesus. Oh, would to God they knew that about us. For I know that ye seek Jesus, which was crucified. Verse 6, He is not here, for he's risen, as he said. Come see the place 
where he lay. And so we know that they went in there, and, and Peter, you know, Peter, boy, he come running uh, and uh, just barged right in there. You read the story about how he came in the tomb and other passages of Scripture. But they went in there and saw the place uh, where he laid. Verse 8, and they departed quickly from the sepulcher with fear and great joy and did run, look, to bring his disciples word. Did you know one thing the resurrection ought to do for us is motivate our witness? I mean, when they got in there and found out Jesus was risen, the Bible says they went quickly to tell other people. Shame on so many Christians that keep us quiet. They didn't want to keep it quiet. No, they wanted everybody to know that Jesus had fulfilled his promise just as he said he would. And so they found out pretty quickly, of course, what it was like to be a witness because when they came and told the other disciples, the other disciples did not believe them. That's all there was to it. The Bible says in Mark 16, 11, they, when they had heard that he was alive and had been seen of her, believed not. Can you, have you ever been excited about something, Lord, and then shared it with somebody and they just didn't believe you? Boy, what a killjoy, amen? Uh, what a wet blanket on a fire. And so said they believed him not. And in Mark 16 and verse 13, and they went and told it unto the residue, that was the rest of them, neither believed they them. Again, as I said, it was too good to be true. But it doesn't matter. It doesn't matter. Whatever promise God gives is too good to be true. All of God's promises are yea in Christ. And, uh, and so uh, we've, uh, when we fail to believe the promise, that lack of faith hinders us from enjoying the blessings of salvation and of God in this life. And so his resurrection uh, was announced by the angels and by Mary uh, and as it began to creep out, I guess finally those uh, guards woke up. And they said, what in the world happened? And now he's gone. And now we got to go tell somebody what happened. They didn't want to, but they did. And so uh, immediately then there was this conspiracy to cover it up. In chapter 28 here in verse number 11. <clears throat> now when they were going, behold, some of the watch came into the city and showed unto the chief priests all the things that were done. And when they were assembled with the elders and had taken counsel. I reckon what kind of counsel that was. They gave, here's how it comes out. They gave large sums of money unto the soldiers. All right? The fix is in, man. The bribe is on. They gave large sums of money unto the soldiers saying, Say ye, his disciples came by night and stole him away while we slept. And if this come to the governor's ears, we will persuade him and secure you. Now, why did he make that statement? Well, he made that statement because, very simply, once word got to the governor, these boys were dead men. Don't worry about it, they said, though. We'll take care of it. Oh, whoa, oh, oh. We are in trouble when government and religion start colluding. And so... They started to uh, pass the word. The guards were bribed in verse 12. They were told to lie in verse 13. Uh, their plot worked in verse 15. I thought of this. I hate to even say it, but I guess I will. Here you see government at work. Bribing. Lying. Huh? Covering up. The Jews... Look past all the evidence of his resurrection and believed a lie. Now, what are you and I supposed to believe? What would we have believed had we been there that day? You ever ask yourself a question like that? I mean, it's easy for you and me sitting on this side of it looking in this, in this grand old book what God said. But if we had been there in that day, what would we believe? Let's think about then not only the events of the resurrection, but let's look at some evidences of it. The evidence is all around us, somebody said, especially this time of year, this springtime. Someone said, our Lord, uh, our Lord has written the promise of his resurrection not in books alone, but in every leaf of springtime. And so we, we have scripture as evidence as well. Look, fraud was impossible. We read the verses there in Matthew 27, verse 62, uh, about uh, what was said, that, uh, what they had done, and then what happened. And just a little thought would have revealed the lie of the guards. Mainly this. 
If they're reporting that his disciples came and stole him, how would they have known that if they were asleep? And uh, why, or excuse me, what are the possibilities of all the soldiers being asleep at once? And somebody said, uh, preacher, you don't know my unit. Amen. But anyway. <laughs> and then this, why would they endanger their lives for just money? What good would the bribe of the religious rulers have done if they weren't alive to spend it? What good would that have done? No, no, uh, look here. No one was interested in finding the truth. And that's the problem in our day. That's why we're hearing these things in the news about discovering our own truth, my truth, like Pastor mentioned last week. Does anybody really want to know the truth about Jesus, about who He is, about what He'll do for you uh, if, uh, if you believe on Him? They would just as soon accept a lie than admit that Christ was who He claimed to be. And so there are evidences to the resurrection of the Lord Jesus Christ. It's been said there's more evidence to prove the resurrection of Jesus Christ than to prove that George Washington was our first president. Of course, we believe that. What are some of the proofs? Well, there's the proof of the clothing. The Lord's clothing. Uh, now, I'm not talking about that shroud. But I'm talking about what the Bible has to say. And for time's sake, we won't all go there. But you can read it. I'll give you the verses. Luke 24 and 12 and John 20, verse 3 through 8. The Bible says that when they, uh, when they went into the tomb to see what had gone on, that there in the tomb were the, was the, uh, the, the, the wrapping that they had put around the body in preparation for burial. And it was as if the Lord had passed right through it. Now, somebody said, well, now how in the world can that be possible? Well, so then after the resurrection, the disciples were scared to death. They went into the upper, upper room and locked the door. And then there was Jesus in the midst. Now, let me tell you, if he can pass through a locked door, he can come out of those clothes, amen, if he wants to. And so there's the proof of the clothing. And the Bible says it makes clear this, that when they went in, they saw the napkin, that is the head wrap that had been around his head, it was folded and placed to the side. Now, I, I believe Jesus did that. As part of the evidence of his resurrection. Let me tell you something. If the disciples had gone in there and stole his body, do you really think that they'd taken the time to fold the laundry before they left? No, sir. Jesus did that for you and for me. And so there was the proof of the clothing. But then in the Bible it's clear there's also the proof of the crowd. The best witness is an eyewitness. And, uh, and uh, Jesus appeared in the Bible uh, to a great number of people after his resurrection. Luke wrote in Acts 1 and 3 that Jesus showed himself alive after his passion that is his death and burial, by many infallible proofs. Now, let God be true and every man a liar. Amen. So the Bible says there's proof. Being seen of them, that is his disciples, 40 days, and speaking of the things pertaining to the kingdom of God. Jesus appeared uh, to, uh, in many ways to his people before he ascended. The first that we think about is Mary of Magdalene. She was the one that ran to the tomb, and she didn't recognize the Lord. You know, uh, he was there, but she didn't recognize him. She thought he was the gardener, the Bible said. She said, sir, if you will tell me where you've taken him, I'll take care of, these, of this process that needs to be done. She talked to him. She didn't recognize him until he called her name. Mary and buddy, she got it then. The Bible says that her and those ladies there that were with her grabbed onto his feet and worshipped him. You know, I think about that. The Bible says that you and I have not seen him. And it's possible maybe if we did, we wouldn't recognize him. But you know that just like Mary, the first thing that we'll see of his resurrection is not sight, 
It'll be hearing. When the trumpet sounds. Huh? And then we'll know him. And we'll worship him as they did. There's Mary Magdalene. Oh, Mary's story is wonderful. You know, it's been said that every time Mary is, at, uh, is seen, she's at Jesus' feet, worshiping him. Why would that be? Well, the Bible tells us in Luke chapter number 7, verse 41, where the Lord said there was a certain creditor which had two debtors. The one owed 500 pence, the other 50. And when they had nothing to pay, he frankly forgave them both. And the Lord asked the question then, Tell me therefore which of them will love him most. Simon answered and said, I suppose that he to whom he forgave most. And he said unto him, Thou hast rightly judged. You know, when we don't worship the Lord, it's really... a. uh, a representation of the fact that we do not appreciate the forgiveness of our sin. And the Bible tells us that Jesus had cast seven devils out of Mary. She was demon possessed. Her life was a wreck when Jesus came in her life. You know what? I could probably count. More than seven demonic influences that he saved me from. Booze. Illicit living. Unbelief. Ungodliness. And the list could go on. Seven devils he cast out of her. And somebody said, Christ always reveals himself first to those who love him most. God help that to set into our heart and mind this morning. Then he appeared to Simon Peter. And that's a wonderful story. We don't have time for all these, but Simon Peter in Luke 24, 34. Simon was at least apparently, if he did not, if he did not show himself to Simon before Mary, then it was right after Mary anyway. And he appeared to encourage him. Oh, it's a wonderful thought. Prior to Jesus' crucifixion, Peter had denied the Lord three times. He said, I don't know the man. I don't know the man. And the, pe- the, the unbelievers around him were saying, you know him and your speech is telling on you. You know him. I don't know the man. He denied him three times. And, of course, the Bible says that the Lord that he said, Peter, before, I, before this happens, you're going to deny me three times. Before the cock crows. And that's exactly what happened. Peter denied him. Now let me ask you something. Is there anybody in your life that passed on before you had a chance to say something to them that needed to be said? Anybody? And then he's gone in a brutal death. Look here. Jesus stood for Peter. And Peter denied the Lord. Can you imagine what heartbreak must have been in Peter? The Bible tells us it was there because the Bible says he went and wept bitterly. You know what I'm convinced we need more of in our churches? Some bitter weeping. And uh, and so the Lord appeared to Peter. Reminding us, reminding us that there is a place of forgiveness and restoration. (laughs) And he told Peter, he asked him three times in front of his brethren, then later on, lovest thou me more than me? (laughs) You reckon Peter thought about that minute alone with Jesus? When Jesus made a special attempt to talk to him and restore him. Do you think Peter thought about that at that moment when all the disciples? But I'm telling you, oh, for private times with Jesus like that. Peter had them. Lovest thou me more than me? And that's why he said, as he stood there with everybody looking around, Lord, you know. Thou knowest that I love thee. 
Simon Peter. Then he appeared to the apostles, well, to the two disciples on the Emmaus Road. He appeared to them, talked to them about himself out of the old. They didn't even recognize who he was until he disappeared out of their sight. Remember we talked about, I think it was last week, maybe a week before, and when they found out what had just happened, they'd been walking with the Lord, and he'd been talking to them about himself. They said, oh, how our hearts did burn within us when he opened the scriptures, taught us the word of God, appeared to the disciples. First time in the upper room there, Thomas missed it. You know the story. Should have been there. Should have been gathered with God's people. But he wasn't there. Wasn't there. And he missed it. And then when the disciples told him, hey, we saw the Lord. We saw the Lord. He said, I'm not going to believe you. I'm not going to believe you, you know, until I put my fingers and holes in the hand and, and my hand in the, uh, in the wound in his side. I'm not going to believe you. Friend, can I tell you, if you start falling out of the gathering of saints, that kind of unbelief will happen to you too. That's right. And so there was, there was Thomas, and then he appeared again there with Thomas. I love what happened. You know, the disciples were there. Thomas was there. The Lord appears, and for all of his boldness, when the Lord finally showed up, Thomas never did say or never did do what he said he's going to do. According to the Bible, it never, never does appear that he laid one finger on him. He fell at his feet and said, my Lord and my God. And then I like the fact that the Lord appeared to 500 at once. In 1 Corinthians chapter number 15, he talks about it there. Let's look there for a moment, please, if we could. 1 Corinthians 15. I love this passage of Scripture. And of, uh, been able to be used, uh, been able to, uh, uh, allowed by the Lord to use it so many times with those who trust Christ with regard to their belief in the resurrection. But in, uh, in 1 Corinthians chapter 15 down here, in verse number uh, 4 says, And he was buried and he rose again the third day according to the scriptures. And that he was seen of Cephas, that's Peter, then of the twelve. After that he was seen, look here, of above 500 brethren at once. Of whom the greater part remain under this present but some are falling asleep or died. So here was the point of that. He, he, he showed himself to 500 brethren at once. Paul said, uh, a good portion of those are still alive. Go ask them. That was the point. Go ask them. They'll tell you the same thing that I told you about the resurrected Christ. Let me ask you something. What, 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 what are the odds People say, well, all these people were drunk on new wine or whatever. Really? What are the odds of 500 people seeing and hearing the same thing at the same time and telling the same story? Unless it really happened. And so he made himself, he made his resurrection sure. And I like it there, you know, uh, after he was risen, the disciples were out fishing. Uh, I imagine there was probably some discouragement. Some of them were looking for the kingdom, right? They were looking for him to establish the kingdom. Next thing they know, he up and got himself killed. Peter made, some, made a famous statement, I go fishing. You know, there's a lot of times when we're tempted to go back to the old way. The thing we're comfortable with. The thing that made us miserable, and then we got saved, and we found out being a Christian wasn't so easy, but we want to go back and be miserable again. I go fishing. The problem was, maybe not so much with him, but with the others who said, we go with thee. It's a shame that our life would ever, considering we have a resurrected Christ, it's a shame that our life would ever come to the place where we discouraged others from following the Lord. And so he appeared to them, uh, and uh, Paul saw him on the Damascus road. Paul, hey, 
Paul, brother, he, he, every time he had an opportunity in the New Testament to share, his, to share his testimony, he always went back to the Damascus Road. As one, he said he believed and got saved as one born out of due time. And so there's the proof of the clothing. There's the proof of the crowd. And then there's the proof of the congregation. Think for just a moment with me, would you, about the church? Do you know why we're gathered here? Just in this place, over 40 years, People have been gathered in this place to worship the Lord in spirit and truth. Do you know why? Because there's a resurrected Savior. That's why. The proof of the church. You think about for a moment. The proof of the, uh, of the congregation when it comes to salvation. The Bible says in 2 Corinthians chapter 5 and verse 17. Therefore if any man be in Christ he's a new creature. Old things are passed away. Behold all things are become new. And this is much more than just turning over a new leaf. The Bible says it's new life from the Lord. In Romans chapter number 8 and verse number 7. Because the carnal mind is enmity against God. For it is not subject to the law of God, neither indeed can be. Here's my point. Oh, that we had the time just to open the floor for testimony about what Jesus had done for you. And you. And you. And you know, it'd be many different. We come to Christ from many different backgrounds, from many different experiences in life. But in one case, the testimony would always be the same, and that is this. He met me where I was. Forgave me my sin and saved me, and now he's taken me to where he wants me to be. That's proof of a resurrected Savior. You think about the unity of the church, and many people, many backgrounds, but a common bond in Christ. And then you think about the longevity of the church. The church has been around ever since, uh, well, some say the Gospels, other Acts, chapter number 2, when the Holy Spirit came and empowered the church at Pentecost. And the church keeps on keeping on. It keeps on keeping on. Oh, I know. You say, well, I know a church down the road that ain't keeping on no more. No, but there's a church somewhere keeping on. And there has been... Ever since. Because Jesus said, I will build my church and the gates of hell shall not prevail against it. Well, you think about the church. And some people say, well, we can't believe the testimony of Christians. They're biased. Okay, then. Let's listen to the testimony of a lost man by the name of Gamaliel in Acts chapter number 5 and verse 38. He said to the people, he said to the, to the, uh, to the authorities there that were abusing the, the church and trying to stamp it out, Gamaliel, a lost Pharisee, said in Acts 5 and 38, And now I say unto you, refrain from these men. Now somebody needs to go to Washington and say the same thing to them about the church. Leave them alone. He said, refrain from these men and let them alone. For if this counsel or work be of men, it will come to naught or nothing. But if it be of God, <laughs> you cannot overthrow it. Lest haply ye be found to fight even against God. So here's what a lost man said. He said, I don't believe it neither, but leave him alone, because he thought it was a work of man. So he said, if this work be of men, it'll come to nothing. But brother, she's still moving on for Jesus. Why? Because there's a resurrected Christ. And it's not a work of men. It's a work of God. And Jesus Christ is the head of his church, has been, always will be. And so there is evidence of the resurrection if we'll look. Some people are like the folks in the, you know, that believe the bride. They didn't want to know the truth, so they just looked by all of it. 
But there's evidence there. The resurrection of Jesus Christ is vitally important. It's important to the believer. Because Paul tells us in this very passage of Scripture, in 1 Corinthians chapter number 15, uh, that, that we're in trouble if Jesus didn't come out of the grave. He said in verse chapter 5, verse 13, If there be no resurrection of the dead, then is Christ not risen. Now that makes sense, don't it? And if Christ be not risen, then is our preaching vain. Reckon how many preachers. We don't even know how many martyrs there have been in the Christian faith. We can read stories about men that stood up and preached the Bible and were burned at the stake. That's an awful way to die, don't you think? The Bible talks about them in Hebrews chapter number 11 and 12. It talks about how they were torn asunder, persecuted. Uh, when it goes, you go through the whole list there, and, and the, the author of Hebrews says, Of whom the world was not worthy. Persecuted unto death. And Paul said, look here. If Jesus didn't come out of the grave, that's a vain thing to do. Have you ever thought about it? After the resurrection, that became the primary message of the church. He is alive. He is alive. You see it all in the book of Acts. He rose from the grave. He's alive. Folks do not give up their life for something they think could possibly not be true. And he says in verse 17, And if Christ be not raised, your faith is vain, and ye are yet in your sins. Now this is interesting, isn't it? Because Paul said, if Jesus didn't come out of the grave, you're still a sinner, and you're in trouble. <laughs> and verse 18 says, Then they also that are fallen asleep, that though they're dead, in Christ are perished. There's no more hope. If in this life only we have hope in Christ, we're of all men most, most miserable. Yeah. Because living for the Lord's hard. It's tough. Some people lost their life for it. Sacrificed everything they had for it. Went through trials and difficulties that we, that we, we couldn't even explain or understand. What a waste of a life if Jesus didn't come out of the grave. Why not just live for money? Why not just live for pleasure? Right? Why not just live for things? Why not just live for everything in the world that I can get my grubby hands on? Because of verse 20. But now is Christ risen from the dead. And not only that, but he is the first fruits of them that slept. He's the first one to be resurrected, and there's a whole bunch more coming after. Hallelujah and amen. Yes, sir. The resurrection is important to the believer. The resurrection is important to the unbeliever. Now, if you're here with us tonight or this morning, you're not sure you're saved. Let me tell you this. There is a risen Savior, and he said, whosoever will, let him come. A dead Savior can't save you from your sins, but a living, can, a living Savior can and will. If you'll come to him. But now I, is Christ risen from the grave? And if he did come out of the grave, which all the evidence is there, and we've talked about that, then that means that he, that he is who he always said he was. The Son of God. It's important because it's a fact. And you and I... Uh, have assurance because of that truth as believers. Because he is alive, the Bible says, all men will stand before him. In John chapter 5 and verse 28, Marvel not at this, for the hour is coming, the Lord said, in which all that are in the grave shall hear his voice and shall come forth. They that have done good unto the resurrection of life, they that have done evil unto the resurrection of damnation. That's red letters in my Bible. That means Jesus said it. See, the Bible's, the Bible's clear that you'll either stand before Him as your Savior or you'll stand before Him as your judge. But you will stand before Him. Every knee will bow and every tongue will confess that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God the Father. It's coming. It's coming bigger than a train uh, in a tunnel. It's coming. And what you do with Him in this life will determine how you meet Him one day 
The Bible says it's appointed unto men once to die, and after this the judgment. Hebrews 9 and verse 27. Somebody said the Gospels don't explain the resurrection. The resurrection explains the Gospels. And, and, and that belief in the resurrection is not an appendage to the Christian faith. It is the Christian faith. And so the resurrection of Jesus Christ sets him apart from every other self-proclaimed Savior. A dead Savior can do nothing for man. The only empty tomb of a professing Savior is the tomb of Jesus Christ. All others are occupied. And one day he'll be our judge. But God gives the wonderful promise in Acts 13, 36 when he said, For David, after he had served his own generation by the will of God, fell on sleep, meaning he died, and was laid unto his fathers and saw corruption. That's not a real positive thing to think about, but that's what's going to happen to every one of us if Jesus doesn't come. But he <laughs> whom God raised again saw no corruption. Be it known unto you therefore, men and brethren, that through this man, Jesus Christ, is preached unto you the forgiveness of sins. Why? Because he's risen, as he said. Let's stand together and bow our heads for prayer.